Before we get started, we wanna let you know that we got some tour dates. We wanna invite you to take it up and come see us for a night of unpredictable comedy and harmonious music. How does that sound, right? That sounded really good. I might go to the show. We're gonna be singing and talking to each other and like who knows what else is gonna happen, but it's sometimes it involves uh, weird get-ups. Well, Every show is different. We never know what's gonna happen. We're gonna be in Las Vegas June 21st, Salt Lake City June 22nd, Denver, Colorado June 23rd, Milwaukee, Wisconsin June 25th, Indianapolis, Indiana June 26th, Detroit June 27th, Omaha, that's in Nebraska June 29th, Minneapolis, Minnesota June 30th. And then later in the year, we're gonna be in Houston, Texas on September 4th, New Orleans September 5th, Birmingham on September 6th, Jacksonville, Florida on September 7th, Tampa, Florida, September 8th, Albuquerque, New Mexico, November 20th, Phoenix, Arizona, November 21st, Sacramento, California, November 22nd, and Valley Center, California on November 23rd. Again, these are all the dates for the rest of 2019 and most likely for quite some time. So if you wanna see us, hmm, now's the time to tick it up. RetinLinkLive.com. Now on with the biscuit. <laughs> Welcome to Ear Biscuits, I'm Link. And I'm Rhett. This week at the Round Table of Dim Lighting, we are exploring the question, were the 20s the best years of our lives? Now we didn't live during the 1920s. It's like when the we were in our, 20s? When we were in our 20s, was that the best time of our lives? Have we peaked? Did we peak long ago? That's a different out. question. Was it? I think best and peaked are two totally different questions. And, oh, well, it sounds uh, like you're already answering the I, question. I have lots of thoughts on best, what? and I think it has lots of implications for how, well, I, I don't wanna spoil it. What about your best peaks? Uh, do, are we gonna get back into which kind of peak you're talking about again? <laughs> uh, I, no. I do need to acknowledge that my voice is otherworldly. It's very, you know, is it very DJ-esque? I feel like it's, yeah, so Link's still a little under the weather, but I actually, maybe I've adapted to your voice. Maybe maybe this is the new you. I, I don't hear it anymore. I know, it's like I'm still having this head cold thing. Is this me for, is this permanent Link? Well, you know what, I've is been. This per, am I, is this my permalink? I've been. <laughs> I've been in a constant state of feeling like I'm getting what you have. Um, I mean, I've done things like I haven't been going of to course. work out. I've You're been, in a I've constant state everything. of getting everything. That's that's called being a hypochondriac. No, no but it's I've got I have physical symptoms. Yeah, I have that slight headaches, slight sore throat, from very slight hypochondriacism. But you know, I think I'm going to be okay. Well, when we were riding in the car. I mean, if I encounter anybody, I'm like, don't touch me, don't touch me, it's for your own good. And then we're in the car and I'm like, don't touch me, but I'm touching stuff in your car. And then I noticed that I finished my coffee and I put the coffee down and then uh, you adjusted the temperature gauge on your car, <laughs> whatever it's called, your temperature dial. You wanted it to be cooler, my friend. And I couldn't help but notice and I did point out that as you were touching the temperature dial, your finger was rubbing up against the, my coffee lid where my mouth goes. Yeah, because you got this big thermos you take I, everywhere. I'm like, like why, do you, why does it have I'm to like, be so big? Why do you, why do you, do you, why do you why need so much coffee? Why does it gotta so be my thermos's coffee? fault? Well, it's your, your thermos for is your so big on the, that it was blocking the temperature controls. It's tall, man. I, there was no way to, to adjust the temperature without touching your mouth hole on your thermos. Everything's bigger with the Linkster. <laughs> I'm like Texas. <laughs> I'm like Texas, I man. I think you're just compensating for something. Um, uh, yeah, I, I like to drink coffee, homie. And listen, I was the gracious, you never would have even known that your finger was touching my mouth place on my coffee mug, you know? Don't say mouth place. <laughs> just don't use that terminology. I, and then you, yeah. did you sanitize? I have since sanitized. Did, I wonder what you touched on yourself after you touched my mouth I'm place. I'm actually, uh, I've gotten, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's got video evidence of this, but I feel like I've gotten better at not touching my face. So you don't know if people have video evidence of you not doing something? Like that's that, <laughs> no, that's no. not how evidence works. No, no, you don't, you, you, you it's don't like understand. I'm gonna, I'm gonna present reams of video and in none of this video for the next you're two mis weeks. You're misunderstanding, I think everyone's You are not gonna see along. me touch myself. So if, I, if you have you know, approximately a decade and more specifically about seven years of a daily show 
of a person being themselves in their natural environment, <laughs> being, that natural environment being a desk that he shares with another man. <laughs> that natural environment, Rhett, is a set. Um, How do you reconcile that? I'm there that? so much that it's my natural environment. Okay, it's and not I'm really a basement. My theory is, and I don't, listen, don't do this because I don't want anybody to do this, but my theory is that my frequency of touching my own face has decreased over time. Sure. Because I just feel like I've become more conscious. Now I'll touch the, the hair. You'll touch the That's top not, of the head. This isn't the face. In fact. The face begins where the hair ends. They call this, I heard somebody call this like the golden triangle or he's something like that. He's pointing was, at his mustache. It was, it, I don't know if it's your and eyes, you your hear mouth. Him, he's calling it a golden triangle. Your eyes, your mouth, and your nose, but it's basically a, an ungodly, a high percentage of, of the crap that will make you sick goes in through this place. Yeah. It's not like you're getting a cut somewhere and getting a cold. I mean, it does happen, but it's going in through the golden triangle. I don't know well, if that's the term. What is the constellation that forms this golden triangle? Your two eyes and your mouth? It might be your two nostrils in your mouth. Well, That's not really a triangle though, that's more of a trapezoid. But your eyes have holes, your eyes are holes. Your eyes get stuff too. Don't hey, touch your face. let's not forget eyes, they get stuff too, guys. <laughs> I believe that I touch my face less. I touch my face when I think. <laughs> Have I touched about my face yet? Germs. How often do you touch your face? A lot, man. I'm sick, dude. No, no. When Lily, you're not sick. Lily gave me this, and I don't think she was touching my face. I probably, I don't know. I sometimes I'm doing that dad thing where I'm like, wouldn't it be funny if I t acted like I was poking you in the eye? I probably poked my daughter in the eye that's, for the fun well, of it. Let me just say that's and not I, a dad thing. Like. No other dads do that. Just, just speaking. I'm a for, dad. Speaking for, I'm speaking all, for one all dad. other dads. Hey, I'm gonna poke you in the eye. That's not a thing that dads do. I, just like, what do you mean? Graze it. I don't know, man. Yeah, again, I don't it, remember it, doing it. it. Doesn't make. I'm just saying. I. It seems weird for me to say. Oh, I. I just touched my, my face. I touched my daughter's. Face. I just touched my face. I'm very conscious of it. Yeah, you did. I touched my beard. Is that part of the triangle? I think yes. that's just outside of the triangle. Below the triangle. He went over the mouth. Can bacteria go up these hairs and get into what the mouth? What is happening? Did we both just get, are we really caffeinated? This is a different ear biscuit. You uh, never know what you're gonna get. We've, well, we've had an interesting day. We've traveled, we traveled to the west side. It's, it's been always, weird. always a yeah. little bit exciting we, we to see ate, the other side of Los Angeles. We ate brunch out. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, okay, so tell them about, tell them about <laughs> the, the lobby. Okay, and then so, tell them about the brunch. Yeah, we had quite a day. Uh, the first, so this was the two of us and Stevie uh, going to a meeting. You know, we're always meeting with people. Tell them what the meeting's about. Uh, the meeting is about making something awesome into something even better. <laughs> but different, on another medium. Um, it's about something we really wanna happen, we really want you to see and. Because we wrote it and we knew we wanted it to be on television. I mean, I don't know why we can't talk about this. Uh, but I, let's not, I haven't, thought, I haven't thought about it, but yeah. you just talked about it. Yeah, I don't think there's any reason not to talk about it. If we think about it, there might be a reason not to talk about it, but I think that's stupid. Well, you know what we're talking uh, about. But in this particular place that, see, this is the reason that I didn't wanna say what the meeting was about because now I'm gonna give characteristics of the lobby of the place that we were and now people are gonna know where it is. When you tell the people, when you tell the listener what it is we experienced, then it will be clear to everyone involved that the people who made the decision for the thing to be there wanted us to talk about it. So we are exonerated. That's not exactly what I was getting at, but it's cool. Um, they have a koi pond in their lobby and for all, uh, if in every other way, it's a pretty nondescript lobby. There's not anything. It's, it's not big. Like sometimes you go into like, I don't know if you've ever been into the lobby of CAA, the uh, agency, the talent agency. It's not our agent. That Not our agent, but I have been it's in like the lobby. It's like not a sponsor. I, I do visit other lobbies. I'm, visit, I'm kind of a lobby connoisseur. Now if you visit other agents, our agents are gonna start getting shaking in the boots. No, no, I, it was, it was, it, it, I just went to look at the lobby. And also, <laughs> I'm also a foyer connoisseur. Uh, any you know sort of like the beginning of the uh, uh, the beginning of going into a building, whether it's a yeah. home or a building, I'm really into. None of this makes you a douche. Go ahead. Uh, but the uh, this lobby was rather unimpressive, except for the fact that they had a koi pond. Now I will say, when you hear uh, uh, Rhett say they have a koi pond, I would venture to guess that you picture like a um, like a foliage draped environment with uh, like a dark water with some sort of sediment at the bottom, like a pond, and you would be wrong. But I wouldn't blame you for it because that's what I would picture. Matter of fact, even when he said koi pond just then, I still pictured it, even though I was there and that's not what it was. 
It's pretty much just a, a, a sort of a rectangle in the, the middle of a floor. It was like the, the tile that made up the floor, then if you went down a foot and a half and then you laid more of that same tile, it was very modern. But you think the koi need more than that? I felt, I what immediately felt a, sorry for the koi. Well, what brings a koi joy? Do you know? Koi joy. Rhett, you got me. I don't know. I believe that koi joy is found in just being koi. Let's come back to that. Uh, so it's just a square area with uh, approximately 420 gallons of water. But of course, things like koi ponds and lobbies usually aren't the kind of thing that we cannot experience and then not begin asking questions to whoever's closest, which happened to be the the woman who was manning the desk. We had I, a good I guess meeting. she was womaning the desk. We had a good meeting, so after the meeting we were kind of flying high and Stevie went to the bathroom, so we're just, we're just mulling around. And I'm like, hey. Like two old men with their hands in their pockets looking at Koi. And I'm like, hey, receptionist. I didn't call her that, I oh, just gosh. said. I just was like, hey, um, you responsible for these Koi? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, well, yeah, I mean, if one of them jumps out, you, what, what of them, if one of them jumps out. Okay, yeah, she, don't get paranoid, lady. She was like, well, I said, does that happen? She says, yes, it happens and they're very slippery. And so that's when, and then she picks up the male uh, like little tray, the tray, the, the cage kind of male tray. And she's like, and, and like, a, like a basket, like a wire a basket, male basket that you hold letters. She's like, I just put that, I put that on top of the koi and I pushed the koi back into the koi pond. So it's not a male tray, it's a koi pusher. I got koi pushers. Koi catcher. It's a koi catcher. It's a koi catcher that brings me joy. The weird thing she said was, yeah, so sometimes like big trucks will go by and then they'll get kind of agitated and they'll jump out. Wouldn't what? you? <laughs> I don't know, I, I, as if I didn't feel sorry enough for these koi. Eh, but to think about it, you're, you're just a koi, you don't know. Think about how, that's why they're jumping out. They wanna see what the heck is driving by. It's yeah, like, I don't think they want. You don't think they have wants? I don't think well, they have well, wants or well, joys. Why do you have so much, I, so much of a clear idea of what a koi needs? Do you own one? Well, we had friends who housed that for a couple that had a bunch of koi. You know this, Rhett. Yeah, and all the koi died because somebody did something stupid with the water. And who was sad? Well, none of the koi were because they all died. Bingo. <laughs> How much, he had to pay like $75,000. Koi are very koi. expensive fish, especially if they're old and rare. But she they can live like 111 years. Yeah, something like that. Sometimes koi will be left in someone's will. Uh, yeah. Because koi outlive the boys. Uh, after the koi pond. I'm pushing it a little too hard. Though. The koi pond excursion. Trying to make a t-shirt. Or we, we, uh, we, we had a little bit of time before our next uh, appointment. Lots of appointments today. And so we got a little brunch and we needed a quick bite, but we wanted to be a little bit fancy. And so for the first I'm time. I'm on Yelp. First time ever, we go to, well, okay. I'm not gonna say the name of it because that's really what makes this story funny. So we decide on this place that is a chain restaurant that serves breakfast and coffee. Well, it's like Panera, but it's- A little fancier. Yeah, you should spell it. It's French. It's French. It's well, a, it just, it, it, in French, it's Q, the pickle bread or something like that. Q-U-O, no, L-E space, uh, P -A -P -A I -N. I N, which is that's bread yep. in French. Yep, yep. And then another word, Q U O T E D I E N E. Q U O T I D I E N. Yeah, yeah. I was I was close enough, Jacob. I just got two <laughs> letters wrong. <laughs> so there's a parking garage underneath this particular establishment because there's multiple stores or restaurants. So we go downstairs and the woman, like the, the, the parking attendant stops us. She says. You're driving. <laughs> she says, where are you going? And I froze because I don't know how to say this place. And of course Link leans over and says, La pain quite don. <laughs> Just like that. La pain quite don. And I was like, what language was that? I, well, I was just so enthusiastic <laughs> because I was like, ooh, ooh, I know the answer to this. La pain quite don. No, you did not say it. You did not say it in a French accent. You said it in some other accent. La pain quite don. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't being funny. 
but it was I funny. W- I was, I knew the answer. And we needed to park. And I then said, we all started laughing. Well, me and Stevie started laughing, and you laughed. And uh, the, the, the parking attendant woman sort of smiled, and I said, hey, you know, they really need a new name for that place. And she said, LPQ. LPQ. And that's what they call it. There they call go. it there, they call it LPQ because they don't, so they don't have to say, La Pain Contentant. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it it feels good to say it. Yeah. It gives the coy joy. <laughs> La Pan Quinta. So we have had quite a day. The the menu was um very promising and the Yelp reviews were like there was like there were like over seven hundred Yelp reviews in this place and it had over four stars, like almost four and a half it, stars. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't bad. It's just. And then it wasn't good. Well, it was. It wasn't bad. The menu made me think, made me get really excited, and then I just didn't feel like it completely delivered on the menu. Also, the coffee mug had no handle. I I so looked I had over. To, so I had to. This chick was over there drinking her coffee, and she was holding it like a, like a treasured bowl that you would like. Like, Serve uh, the king. Oh yes, the, the monarch yeah. needs to drink of this, or something. The pope would like use ceremoniously. Like that's how he would. She was, she was bringing it to her lips. And then you look over at me. And I was like, me, Why is she doing that? And I was doing the same. <laughs> and you thing. were doing the same thing. Because you don't feel like I you think can, that's what a quintedon. You don't feel is. like you can grab it with one hand. What is a quintedon? You said it was pickles. I know, and you fell for it. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, I but, got you. The on, whole but, my, my whole day, you've been thinking a quintedon is a pickle. Yeah, I know. But here's the thing. Because it was on his plate. You, that's not the that's not the kind of thing you joke about. Just to be just honestly, like that's the kind of just thing I joke about. Just because you fell for it. No, no. Like you usually. Oh, this is your type of joke. No, no. You don't normally do purposely deceptive humor. Like that's the kind of thing I like tell my kids. Is like you know the quantity don't <laughs> it means pickle. <laughs> and so you typically know French because like you. I typically do. Yeah. No, it's funny. We both took three years of French, right. but you retained a significantly higher a well, portion than me. Je mange les haricots French for the daily bread. Is the whole name of the restaurant. The daily bread, okay. Because quanti don means day, daily. Okay. Okay. I Men shall it. not live by bread alone. It doesn't mean the, the bread and pickles, sorry. Um, and if you were to rewind and re-experience this ear biscuit, you would hear at the top, Rhett gave a shout out to pickles. The Q. pickle bread or something like that. Because he was falling for my joke. I, and that really gave me coy joy. <laughs> That was, but That's it, why you do it. It's quite a long play. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I, I feel like I can still recommend the restaurant, just personally, I would say that I, I think you should try it. But I do think that you should say LPQ, just to not embarrass yourself, unless you're French. When you go to a, re- a French restaurant, do you order by initials? Or you give it a shot? I, no, I'm a CPK. California Pizza Kitchen? Yeah, that's French, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna answer your questions, but first, uh, we're gonna let you know that you can look just as tie-dyed as us. I mean, we are, we just look like we just took regular shirts into a washing machine. Tie-dyed in the wool. You got your Hi Daddies, creepy, creepy, cotton candy Randy. He's busting out of my chest. And you can call him and he'll answer question, he'll answer your question and respond to your call, uh, as part of the Mythical Society content that, that's being cooked up and released over the summer every Thursday. Yes, he will. I got this mythical tie-dye. Describe it. That's a, uh, a, a Randler with a third eye, uh, the all-seeing eye of the, of the Randler uh, put into a... You know what, don't describe it. It takes away the mystique. They can see it. Oh, see it with your third eye. You can, you know what? You can see both shirts that we're wearing with your third eye, is an ironic thing. But you can only buy them at mythical.store. Can't buy things with your third eye. Would you rather have a third eye or a third leg? <laughs> <laughs> well, if the third leg is a euphemism for penis, I already have one. Noted. Uh, so I think I go with eye. Okay. That was still technically part of the ad. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, mythical.store. That's uh, what you get for watching the video version. Right, you get extra, extra stuff. Let's start with a question from Annie, known as Celestial Link. I guess that's in reference to you, Link, on Twitter. 
Yeah, if I weren't me, I would still devote my entire Twitter experience to me. If you could that would go, be my choice as well. <laughs> if you could go back in time and bring <laughs> one current invention with you, which you would be credited for inventing, what would you bring and why? So you go back in time, you can take something with you uh, and you will be credited with inventing it. Is there a size limitation on this time traveling device? Let's say no. I would say no. Uh, I have a specific answer that then leads to a more general and powerful answer. You know, I'm gonna do it in reverse. I have a general answer, but then I have a more specific. Can I just answer, you wanna go first? No, I'm interested, I do have an answer, but now I'm very intrigued. I would take, um, back in time, I would take an aerobi. You remember the aerobi? I do, finally. Uh, when we were in college, we could not be satisfied with a normal spinning, flying projectile that you can throw and catch in the in the little grass patch beside your apartment. No, we had to get the the world's longest flying device that can be thrown from hand to hand. We had to get the aerobi. A it's a quite an amazing e flying disc. E-R-O-B-I-E for flying those of you ring. Googling this, the flying ring. Um, they make a boomerang version as well. They make two different sizes, maybe three different sizes. It actually comes back to you. Uh, but they do not float. They will fly a long way. They will sink uh, in water. And they will sink in water because we've lost we've lost a few aerobies in some ponds. And, and not just ponds, they fly so far. Sometimes they would just go into the woods and we would never ever find them again. Let me tell you, some of the most exhilarating experiences I think we ever had were just, Getting so far from each other that we we barely we could we were questioning whether we were still looking at our friend, yeah, and chucking this aerobi and then just seeing it soar, and then the thrill of seeing that person catch it. Mm. And I got to hand it to us, man. We were good at throwing an aerobi. We weren't great at catching it though. Well, it's not hard to catch it. We were good at catching it. If you don't catch it, it's pointless. And it's it kind like of fail. It, it catches the wind and sort of like hovers and, and, and you think, and whoa! You'd think you were about to catch it, and you'd be right here with your hands like splayed out in front of your face, and then all of a sudden, when it was like five feet out and rapidly approaching, it just it would catch a breeze like a hawk going over a canyon, yeah, like catching a thermal, a, a thermal, and it would just it would take off and. It would go another 400 yards, it felt like. Well, it, it felt it, like. It go another 38 yards. Well, I it, would take one of those back there's in no, time. There's no place in Los Angeles to throw one of these. There's no open space large enough. The reason why this is top of mind is because Lando, we had, we had some unstructured time where we were hanging out a couple weekends ago and I was like, whatever you wanna do, bud, let's do it. And, he was, and his answer immediately was, I wanna go buy a tetherball. That was his answer. Yeah, this is a child that is used to not having a lot of space. So he needs went, a ball tied to a pole. <laughs> right, that's its idea of fun. They do it. They play tetherball at at school, and he fancied himself uh, a semi pro. Now you didn't buy him one, did you? Hell yeah, I bought him one. Okay. I asked him whatever he wanted. I'll do it. So I called the Big Five, and I was like, "Do you have tetherballs?" And they were like, "Yeah, of course they do." So that's we, pretty much what they're known for. Tetherballs are us. <laughs> I think is what they used to be called. <laughs> They were like, yeah, we got those. So we go over there, I'm like, well, they only have one left. I was like, this woman was risking a lot and just like that snap answer. Well, it's, it's like, probably been there for she, weeks. She should have said we only got one left. You better get over here right now. <laughs> I was like, Lando, okay. we're just, we, snatch it, buddy. Because yeah. we, You're buying the one tetherball people have bought in 2019. Like, okay, now call the factory. We gotta get, the, we gotta get another tetherball because they're coming I, in to get it. As we were leaving with that tetherball, I saw a guy walk in and I was like, I looked at Lando, I was like, He's gonna be disappointed. I knew, I could tell he wanted a tetherball. But all, before we checked out, I went past and they had an aerobi and I was like, Lando, look at this. And I told him the story that I just told you. Way better than a tetherball. And we also bought a $10 aerobi. They don't have the big ones though. You, yeah, usually. they do, yep. Okay, big you got one. a big one? Yep. Where are you gonna throw that? Well, we went to the park and they had a tetherball pole. That's why he knew he wanted to buy a tetherball. Oh, you didn't buy the pole and the base, you just bought the ball and the string. Right. Find your own pole. A legit pole at the nearby playground. Uh, bring your own ball and tether. There was no ball, ball or tether there, it was just a pole. Wow, what is the world coming to? I know man, you can't leave a tetherball hanging around, someone's gonna take that. Oh yeah, 
Just like rims. Taking the rims off a of, like off a of, off a souped up Civic. Uh, interesting that you would take that you would take a, an Aerobie back. Uh, so you think that would gain you fame and fortune? Because that was kind of how I approached this. No. Uh, because I think it would be cool, and people would think I was awesome. But then, as I was like making the rounds, like selling tickets for like my exhibitions of throwing the aerobie and whatnot, and um. I would also educate the people about the aerodynamic design which would then lead to the invention of the airplane wing because I would go back that far in time. Oh. Cuz you know even on the aerobi packaging it talks about how it achieves lift like a wing because of the the way the lip is designed I believe. So I would actually go back in time. I was going to just say I was going to take a wing of a plane with me. Yeah, but then the, the Wright brothers would have invented a giant Frisbee and we w still wouldn't be flying. <laughs> You'd probably screw the whole thing up, you well, know what I'm saying? It's like, all right, no, Orville, <laughs> well, I can, trash the plans. I can tell by There's your, a man with a flying disc. I can tell by your ridicule that you are tracking with my statement. So would you take but it I to I the Wright brothers? With it. I would, I would pre-live pre the Wright brothers. I would be there in, in, in the 18, Late 1800s. Why don't you just skip the aerobie and go for plane? I already answered that. Okay. But the wow factor, I two think, for one. I think the wow factor of inventing aviation, because who invented the aerobie in this universe? That's because the plane already existed. Do you know existed. his name? No, you don't. Well, if the plane didn't exist, then you would know his name. <laughs> and that's when I'm going back in time with an aerobie to yeah. invent flight. I took a different tack. Um, I would, Good. This is a difficult thing to take back. I admit that I would take public storage back. <laughs> what? Oh, you greedy! Okay, <laughs> I so see where you're going with a, this. The guy who invented public storage is a guy named Brad Hughes. He is worth two point two billion dollars. Good gosh! In 1980, he all he did was nothing. No, the story goes like this, my friend. He needed to store some stuff, and he had a warehouse. And it was completely full, and he was like, "What am I? What am I gonna do?" And he came up with the idea, what for what he called private storage, which actually makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. But then when he took it to market, he had changed it to public storage. Market for marketing reasons. He's like eighty-five years old. The dude's worth two, over two billion dollars because he just came up with the idea that there should be little cubby holes for adults out in out in the world that you can just pay for. And no one thought of this until the 80s. I mean, take that aerobie. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You just go back with a, I would go back with a, in fact, I'd probably go, my time machine would probably be the storage bin. And then I would just unsheath it and come out and be like, this is not only a time machine, that's not really what's important. Put your stuff in here, <laughs> pay a monthly fee. Hand me your money. Now, here's the other thing, because I also was thinking about the time period. You gotta go back to, the late 1800s? Okay, okay, okay. Before antibiotics, I'm going back to <laughs> 1980, brother. Like, you know what I'm saying? Tom it's just Cruise like, movies. you basically have all the luxuries of modern times. There's less channels, first of all. I take all my, uh, my storage money and I just cruise around in a boat. You could come with your aerobie. We could toss it on, I mean, my boat would be so big that you could throw a full size aerobie on it. But flight wouldn't exist because I wouldn't have gone back in time. <laughs> Is that, okay. So they're not mutually exclusive. Um, you could also. I think public storage is like the one thing that the majority of people on earth when polled could agree upon as being abhorrent. Like there's just something about it. Yeah, but here's the thing. That's like, you, don't you even, know what? I'm having a negative response to you, just you saying you don't, public but storage. You do, okay, how about this? Beanie Babies, that guy's worth 1.9 billion. Oh, is this your runner up? And uh, you, all you have to do is take a Beanie Baby back and you could take that back to 1986 because that's when he invented that. That guy's a chump, man. But it's a lot easier to travel Stuff with a Beanie Baby with through time. In it. You know? So I, maybe I now, just, see you know what, fits, no, you know what I would do? that fits your brand. I'd take a, talking about beans. I'd take a storage bin full of Beanie Babies back. And I'd be like, I got two ideas for you fools. It'd be like, well I gotta get a lot of Beanie Babies before I can justify this public storage thing. I think we've answered that. Shauna Brown asks, is it better to be knowledgeable or better to be ignorant? In other words, 
Is ignorant truly bliss or is it better to have knowledge of something even if it means it can cause pain or chaos? I'd say a corollary question which we gleaned from Facebook from Megan Elizabeth Taylor. Yes, wow. that Megan Elizabeth Taylor. Would you rather be a worried genius or a joyful simpleton? Is ignorance truly bliss? And how mm. how did you approach this question in your brain? I don't know your answer, of course. Well, I took it. Uh, would I rather be the kind of like my state of being as a person would be someone who is knowledgeable about everything, including the things that might potentially bring me anxiety and trouble, uh, or someone who is just unawares of things that might bring worry. And I and and so as someone who, um, you know, is at least somewhat knowledgeable about enough things to uh, bring myself anxiety and trouble, uh-huh. I would say that my my, my knee jerk reaction is to say that I, um, at, me personally in the current state, I like I want to know I want to know things like when we talked about the. Um, the simulation. Well, I mean, no, all of that well, stuff. Yeah, yeah. You want to? You want? You you're always opting for knowledge. And we also we talked about. The, Are you going uh, the other way? No, no. I'm talking. I'm saying me. This version of me wants to know things, including like you know. On, we talked about this on Twenty Three and Me. I maybe we talked about this, but you can like basically check. Yes, I want to know if I've got the, the you know the A predisposition to Parkinson's disease. Right, do I have these specific genetic markers that lead or, to these illnesses? I, I actually don't know if that's one specifically. I don't know what they are, but I checked all of those and looked at all the information. Like as soon as I had the opportunity to, my instinct was just to look. So, right, but in this, but that's in the not way how this I is framed, this. you're saying if you could snap your fingers and just be a different person, like different brain personality makeup, you would opt to check your intelligence at the door and walk in anticipating that what, you would be a happier person. Well, let me just say that I don't think that I'm un, I'm unhappy. I don't think that I'm currently unhappy. But if I had to choose between, like that, the way that the second uh, question was phrased, worried genius or joyful simpleton, like if you're actually saying the state of the genius is that they're worried or the state of the simpleton is that they're joyful, I would definitely choose joyful simpleton. And I wouldn't know what I was unaware of. You know, and so, I'm. Yeah, you wouldn't know what you don't know. I'm all about that, man. I w- I would definitely choose that if I had the choice. I'm surprised by that. I just, I just, I just feel like that's really incongruent. I I still don't get it. I I just think. I re- I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. Y- yeah, you're saying. I'm you saying can, that me it, right now. If there's something to be known, if if you'd rather this, be in this rather version happy, of me, it's basically would you rather be happy instead of knowledge knowledgeable. It, you, burdened with some sort of knowledge or freed to just be happy. Yeah, and, and I understand that this seems inconsistent with my answer about the like the simulation, the matrix, and like would you, but the way I was thinking about that was is that I actually knew that there was a possibility that there was something else and I could experience it by unplugging myself from the matrix and then experiencing the real world. Yeah. This you're so this is like ignorant. I'm literally you do not know my mind you, in this sense would not be would not be able to comprehend anything that would bring me worry. That I'm saying if the alternative is being able to comprehend those things and then bringing me grief, then I would choose the joyful simpleton. And if you're giving me these two choices, and I thought that's what I would choose too. But the way that I immediately thought about it, I'm like, what? What are situations that I would opt to not know about in order to it like because when people talk about ignorance is bliss, they're usually talking about a specific subset of knowledge, like related to something. Like um but then I tried to come up with what would be that thing that's burdensome that it would I would be happier if I didn't know about it. But then I'm like, well, climate change. Well, no. I mean it's it's I I, obviously, I would rather know about that so that I can be engaged in being part of the solution, you know. Even though it it weighs heavily on the mind, it's actually like 
creeping up constantly in the back of my mind. And I think that's, I'm sure you would agree that's a good thing. You know, uh, we need more of that. More of that. Um, Concern, yeah. Yeah, just like a discomfort associated with just the, the seething of our planet. But I, th- but but I was what if it was more personal? Okay, so I, I, do, I have a personal example. Okay. Um, if you have a relative who they've got some indication that something's wrong with them and then they're, they have tests done and then they're waiting on the test to come back. And especially being like across the country, it's not like you talk to them every day or you see them and like you know, where were you yesterday? Oh, I went into the doctor. It's like they kind of have to volunteer this information. And yes, this has happened. And I think, in ge- maybe we've talked about this, but there's an inclination to like say, I'm gonna spare you the knowledge that I'm awaiting a test because that we think something's wrong and it may be bad news. I'm gonna wait until I get the results back and then I'm gonna, gi- I'm gonna give those to you. And then I'm like, well, yeah, I understand that instinct. I too have that instinct. It's like I don't wanna burden my mom with something that's happening when I don't really have answers or there's nothing actionable. Like just as an example, um, but I but I second guess that you know it's as another example. So I'm like I, don't, I actually don't think that works because you know you're denying their ability to love you through the unknown, and that's a and you know that happens in life, and no one should go through uh, the unknown where they can only wring their own hands. You want to be able to hold hands with somebody, so to speak. Um, so I, that was my personal example, that didn't work either. So I'm actually unable to come up with anything that I would well, rather not know when I approach it from that way. Yeah, but I, I guess what I'm saying is is that you're approaching it from this point in time sure. with these life circumstances. So yeah, now, but can, now but can that- Can you think of one? Can you think of a practical example within that way of approaching the problem that's like, actually it's better not to know. No, and I think we talked about this before, it's like, I, my tendency is to believe that knowledge about something like data related to anything is ultimately better. Knowledge is power. Than, than not having it, than not knowing something because you're, you're gonna be able to do something even if it's like knowing when you're gonna die. You know, I don't know if you've specifically talked about that situation. Um, but I think I would, I think I would wanna know. I think I would wanna know. Right, but do, so, Ch- skipping back to the other way, do you f- do you feel like you know or have known people who are more of the they're in more of an ignorant and blissful zone? I think I I think I know people that way. Well, it, 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 okay. Do you do you wish you were one of those people? Because I think that brings it into focus. No, because I'm not unhappy. What what I'm saying is this is how I interpret the question. Let's just say I'm in the ether. My soul is in the ether before I inhabit my next body. I'm okay. not saying I believe that this is how the world works, but you let's just say do. that this is how the world works. You wouldn't say it if it And whoever mean. makes the decision about what body you end up in says, Rhett, I, of course they have the voice of Morgan Freeman, which I can't do. Uh, that wasn't in, it. In a impersonation of him, but I'm just gonna, this is my voice, so I'll use that. Uh, he says, "Would I'm gonna give you a choice in this lifetime. Would you like to be a worried genius or a, what is it, joyful simpleton? And I was like, those are my choices? Like if if I choose genius, I'm gonna be like a worried, tortured genius, you know? Uh, like, like Nietzsche. Or, <laughs> or you're going to be a, a joyful simpleton, meaning you're gonna be somebody who no one knows about. You're not gonna make any history. You're not gonna to accomplish anything that is Ooh, great in the have eyes you seen of humans. Forrest Gump? Ha! Um, but you know, no. Forrest Gump was tortured. He was he was he was knowledgeable enough to be tortured about Jenna. Uh, so I'm talking about somebody who is just happy, but is may may need other people to take care of them. I don't know what they would might what need. I would choose that scenario if presented with those two options. Okay. But if it was just like, would you rather be ignorant or knowledgeable? I would choose knowledgeable. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna choose to be burdened let's, and knowledgeable. Let's, let's answer the question that we, we started this whole thing off with. Let's pay off that title. Uh, this is from Hannah Brooks. Unless it sucks and then we change it. Hannah Brooks. 
asks, your 20s are the best years of your life. Mm -hmm. In quotes, as if someone told her this. Do you agree with this? What were the best years of your life and why? The 20s is, it's interesting because I usually think of it in terms of like middle school, high school, college, out of college, married, married with, that's how I divide up my life. Married, then married with children. Yeah. And then I can also think about it in terms of our career and I can like start to put different strata in there. But like the 20s, that's the end of, that's like the tail end of college, right? Yeah. The end of college, getting yeah. married, and mostly everything that we did before we really became full-time YouTubers. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it was before we had really found our uh, calling, boy, I, to what we do, to what we kind of have settled into now. It was a, it was a bit of a strange time. It was a strange of figuring it was, things out. Yeah, and there was a lot of there was a lot of it was high stake peril. You know, it was like, okay, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna, you know, what the heck is going on? Because um, I feel like. I'm tempted to say the best days of my life. You know, I'd be tempted to hone in on the college years because those were some great years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you got this budding freedom. You've got this uh, blossoming self-discovery. It's almost falling on you like a like a dump like a dump truck. Mm -hmm. Like you're getting self-discovery is being dumped on you, you just get buried in it. Yeah. That's that's exhilarating. Well, you know, you hold your breath and then you're like trying to, trying to, trying to breathe and get out from underneath it. And I think the reason that adults will often say to young folk, uh, you know, really enjoy this time. Take it, you know, these are the best years of your life and they may be talking about high school or college or whatever. I think what they're actually saying is, if I, with my knowledge and life experience and wisdom that I have get, that I have garnered in the years that I've lived, were able to go back yeah. to high school or go back to college. Oh man, I would just be able to do it right this time. But yeah, when but you're in the midst of it, you don't really understand. And this is every stage of life. Well, okay. So let let let. So just to unpack that a little bit, yeah, because basically you're you're not saying when I look back that was the best strata of my life that I'm experienced. It I was, do think I, it was well, youth I do is think wasted I, on the young is what you're saying. You're saying that if I could go back and redo it, I could most definitely make it the best time of my life that decade. Well, and I and listen, I'm and not I'm not saying that I didn't take advantage of it and that I didn't take advantage of that freedom and I didn't. I specifically remember like that first week of college of like just coming back to my dorm room whenever I wanted to and thinking this is awesome. Having responsibility for just myself is really awesome. Now at the same time, I was really, not as much as you now that I, I didn't even know at the time because you didn't really talk about it. Uh, I was right. really concerned about my academics. I was, especially at freshman, sophomore year, I was like super committed to studying and, and and making good grades and I do recommend <laughs> making good grades. But I think I placed a little too much importance on that, honestly. I kind of got into a little bit better groove in my junior and senior year and uh, but I, I think, yeah, I do think they were the best years of my life in one sense. Are you talking about, you're not talking about 20s though, you're talking about college. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um. Considering the nature of the discovery, the nature of like the fact that I we do think sit out and have these like philosophical conversations that you had never really had in high school, and really meaningful friendships that went beyond sort of the typical high school friendship, like true friends and independent living and independent experience with like being able to go off and say we're going to take a trip to somewhere, we're going to go camping together, us four guys or whatever. Yeah, Th those are things that there were so many firsts. Without any parental supervision, what that it was, and it's, it's not awesome, and not just, but, the, and our, our lives were different because right out of college we got married. But like when we were talking to Stevie on the way to that meeting, she was like, "Have you? What was the show she asked us if we saw? It was like, um, uh, the 
It was about dead. Dead to me? Dead to me. It was like, she was like, have you seen Dead to Me? We're like, no, I never even heard of it. She's like, well, it's, it's, it's a good concept. I don't know how well it was executed, but it's binge worthy. And I'm like thinking, I'm, you know, I'm not in my 20s. I can't, I don't sit around and just look for stuff that's only, that's just borderline binge worthy. I've got like, I didn't jump down Stevie's throat. This is all in my brain, but I'm like, I've got children and I've got, I've got like, all the stuff that I'm doing within there is my no own binging. parameters. The only binging, I got, a, I got a bedtime. The only binging that has taken place for me is those two days that I was on my back after the vasectomy. Right. And you can really only get a vasectomy once. I might get my vasectomy reversed just so I could get it again, just so I can binge watch television. <laughs> I mean, that's literally the only binge watching I've done in 15 years. Stevie's still in her 20s, isn't she? No, she's 31, man. <laughs> Whoops, not in my mind. Well, sorry, Stevie. <laughs> I just mean everybody. Everybody here is in their twenties, in my mind. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Whoops. <laughs> but you know what so I'm saying. So, what's your point? My point is, what is my point? My point is, you like the twenties are are the time for a lot of people where it's like they just got time to do stuff. But for us, the twenties were. Oh, we're we've been th we've thrust ourselves into marriage and thrust is probably not the best we've word. We've thrust we've been we've been catapulted out of college and out from under like any sort of financial support that that our our families or whatever offered. And now we're like we're trying to make this happen. I mean, this was like a scrappy time. I mean, it was it was nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was talking about you know, we both had our engineering jobs and we were hating them and uh, I wasn't realized I was hating them until you kept insisting on how much I should be hating it <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, man, you're right. Let's figure out something else. Let's get together one night a week and come up with comedy. Yeah, comedy night. You know, come up with comedy. Um, then get up the next morning and get to the spreadsheets. You know, and like, uh, Christy was teaching, she had a math degree and a, uh, she taught high school math, she taught geometry and junk like that. And she was like going crazy, going nuts, just trying to figure out how to teach high schoolers. And she was only like, she was only four and a half years older than some teaching. of her students. Mm -hmm. She laid down the law the first day. She's like sending people out right and left. It was like, it was carnage. <laughs> but paddling him? <laughs> yeah, she's she was a paddler. Spank me, Miss Neal. <laughs> that doesn't work. She didn't fall for that one. But it, you know, and so we're both like putting our heads together and trying to figure out how how we survive. You know, right? Like, but we, but you look. I mean, I'm house sitting for this couple. You look out of the country and like we're taking care of a full grown Weimaraner. Yeah, but you look back on those times with uh, nostalgia. No, I don't. I, I do. <laughs> I, I do. Well, any time that there's th a, that period, that scrappy was difficult. period, like first year of marriage, I, let me, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Well, let me just tell you the way that. And Chrissy would say the same thing. You skip that. I well, you can't. I process this in this way. Um, okay, I'm 41, and uh, I they're especially related to like personal. Health and I, you know, physical and emotional health are things that it isn't that I haven't cared about those things, but I have in the past, you know, decade or so, especially probably the past half de decade, just getting older has sort of forced me to be like, ah, I've kind of got to get on top of this. And, I, and I'll use my back as an example of something that has sort of, um, applied to a lot of different areas of my life. Yeah, talk about your back problems. Things so, like <laughs> um, I never did anything about my back in, when I was in high school and when I was in college. Never did anything in my 20s. Ne didn't really do anything about them in my early 30s, but when it became like, okay, this is gonna be a problem. Like if I don't do something about this, I'm going to have, I'll, I'll be in a wheelchair someday. Like I will, I will have lifelong, I will be, I will be disabled. I'm not, not kidding, like my back problems were that bad that if I didn't do something about them, I was going to be disabled. 
And um, so, and I started to do the things that I started to do and continue to do and now it's like my back is healthier than it was when I was in high school in terms of the way that it feels and how often I have pain, right? And it's like a daily struggle to continue to do the things that I need to do. But what I think a lot of times I'm like, man, when I was 22 years old, like I had a 22 year old's spine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like now I've got probably like a 60 year old spine because I didn't do anything all that time. And so the way I kind of process it is, yes, those were good times, but I've actually had, and again, the back is just an example of other things. Like again, I just started going to therapy last year. So I, it wasn't like there was some, necessarily some acute problem. There were some things that kind of came up that led me to finally say, okay, yeah, I, I do need to go to therapy. But there was a lot of years where you I don't just. You think going, going blind was an acute problem? Yeah, I'm saying that was like one of the things that. Okay. Uh, that it wasn't going blind. You can listen to that podcast. But uh, it, there was an acute problem that kind of sent me over the edge. All that to say though is that I feel like now the thing that I can't line up is caring about yourself and taking actual steps to care for yourself and set that on top of youth. Like that would be an incredible thing. And maybe maybe that doesn't happen because when you're young, you just don't feel a need to ad to address these things in the same way. Yeah. You're, you're like, I, got all, youth, I, I have got all yeah. my life. Youth is wasted on the young. But to answer the question, are you saying that the 20s, or maybe you're saying college, either one, was the best decade of your life. Not, well, I'm not talking like retrofit it, I'm talking about just for what it was. I think, and maybe this is just the futuristic, optimistic part of me, um, I still always have a sense that I am entering into the best years of my life. Now, mm -hmm. I, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying like up if I it didn't That's get much weird. It didn't get much better. That seems weird to me in it, a in a good way. It didn't get much that much. It doesn't get that much better than what we I experienced in my 20s in college and all those cool memories or whatever. But there were things about me, the way I thought, the way I approached life, and relationships, etc., uh, that I'm glad I don't still think and do the things that I do, did at the time. Like I like the me that I am now more than the me that I was then. And I and I would hope that that is a progression that continues. I hope when I'm 50, I look back at 41 year old Rhett and I like I like the me now more than I like the me then. Like that isn't what else is life about, right? Now there's this uh, sort of sinking feeling that eventually age will become yeah. an insurmountable problem and that no matter what you do, you're gonna die of something, you're gonna have chronic pain or whatever, maybe there's nothing I can do about my back 20 years from now, who, who knows? Not looking forward to that and answering those questions. But I'm just saying that, you know, I've told, and I told this to Jesse, I was like, I think that my 40s are gonna be the best years of my life. And then I think when I enter into my 50s, I'm hoping that I, my perspective will be, you know, I think my 50s are gonna be the best years of my life. Uh, yeah, I, That's I've my already, attitude. I've already ruled out the 20s and I told you why. Okay. So I think for me, I think the nows, because I'm 40, you know, I, well, I, I don't think it was the 30s. I think, I agree. I feel like I'm, we're on the, we're on, I'm in year one, you're in year two of the best decade. I, I mean, I, I don't, I think the 50s won't be as good. Hey, <laughs> what about, what about grand, Why? grandkids? Why, man? I don't think that, I don't think that's gonna help enough. <clears throat> I think, I think I'm our kids the, are going to be like fifty before they have children. That's, I think I'm that's the, what's going to happen. I'm the best. I feel like I'm the best version of myself that I've ever been, and I, I want to be, an even better version of myself. And I think I'm on that journey, semi aggressively, and I think that's a, I think that's a big part of. I, well, that's a big part of what makes me satisfied is that. I feel like I'm growing and and knowing more about myself, discovering more of myself and who I can be. Self-realization, I guess you call that. Um, and I actually think that there's a, 
and I think we grew up with this, just I'm sorry to interrupt, but to, to uh, add to what you're saying, I think that we kind of had this, and I feel like there's a little bit of an American ideal here to be like, you stay the same. He's the guy that he was when he was, I'm still the same man that I was when I was 20 years old. I'm still the same man, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, I'm like. Well, don't, conf don't, don't confuse it with a Southern accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that I, I'm from the South and I, in, in many different ways, that mentality was around me. Okay. And so that's how I'm characterizing it. All right, that's fair. But I'm not making a judgment about the South, I'm making a judgment about who I was and where I come from. And what I'm saying is that I believe that constant growth and constant change is actually a sign of health. Um, in, in, not stagnation. Well, yeah, I mean, you, if it's the right kind of change. Of oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Change in the right direction. But I'm like, what is life if it isn't change in the right direction? Like, what if you're not evolving in a certain you're direction? Dying. You're only dying because you are dying. You might as well be growing and living at the same time. And the idea of settling into an, a way of thinking and a way of doing yeah. as soon as I reach my adulthood and then just being. That way forever. Now, maybe you, maybe you was in, were enlightened at age twenty-one, and you just stayed the same. I'm not anywhere near enlightened, but I'm just trying to move in that direction. And so, to me, that's that's what life has become for me is being like, oh, this is what it's about. It's about right here. It's about this moment. It's about moving in the right direction. Yeah. Let me let me put it this way. You know, there's this there's the phrase "live your best life," and um. I'm saying that to people constantly, <laughs> like strangers in the mall. And you stuff. and Joel Olstein live your best life. Isn't did that, he? Did he come up I with think that? He has a book called "Live Your Best Life Now." Oh, uh, okay. well, he added now. <laughs> you're well, taking. I'm. I'm freaking deriving a Joel Olstein novel, not novel. Book. Is, it, is it Olstein or Osteen? Who cares? I don't care. Osteen. Osteen? But well, you're talking about Olstein. Right? Ironically, <laughs> you're not I didn't about realize Olstein. that his book was exactly what I'm saying, which is the, the live your best life is something that you're constantly doing now. <laughs> I totally agree with this and guy. And this is when Joel Olstein walks in. <laughs> Fellas, I'm so glad. <laughs> that you finally figured you it out. You finally figured it out. <laughs> Come to my big old church. <laughs> We've got 700,000 people every Sunday. I think you're making, uh, you know, it's, it's making a decision to say, you know, you tend to focus on the future and like you put it in terms of in the future, I want, I want the future to be my best, but I want this week or this, I, maybe it's, I think it's unfair to say this day and it, depending on what you're going through, it might be this week or this month Just or this now, year. Just say now like Joel. But I, I, I think having a mentality of uh, if if I know that I don't have plans this weekend, and I can either do I can either say well, you know I'm gonna do nothing, I'm gonna let it come to me. I feel like for me personally, more often than not, that's a mistake because it sets me up for not living my best life now. <laughs> But instead, just kind of waiting for, it's like living for the weekend, it's like what about Wednesday? What's my best Wednesday? No. Or what it, if I am on the precipice of the weekend or if I'm thinking about it, it's like what's something that I can do that sets up, as we've talked about before in, in the context of the kids, what are some things that we could set up loosely, not grip too tightly, like the song goes, that will create the opportunity for an experience that could be the best of that, you know, the best experience I could have this day. And that may be sitting on the couch and binge watching whatever dead to me is that I'm never gonna watch, by the way. It's dead to you. But you know, you know what I'm getting at? It's like, I do feel like. Yeah, you're talking about living your best life now. <laughs> if, I, if you have a mentality of like, all right, I've got this, I'm gonna find, I'm gonna find some enjoyment or some, fill in the blank that brings some bestness to it. Yeah, you're talking about gr know. gratitude and mindfulness and yeah, I and I and that that is a challenge for me because I am a, I'm so future oriented. Um and so I was 
And a lot of people are past oriented. They're like, man, those were the good old days. Yeah, and. And I look back, I think you looked back and I do the same thing and that's like, well if I would have known that I had the back of a 20 year old, I would have done things differently. I don't know what the, yeah, and again, that's and there's a, no, a I revisionist thing. And I can't thing. do anything about it. I can't it. do anything about I don't it. Have, I don't have, and if I sounded this way, I didn't mean to. I don't have regrets about it necessarily. I'm just happy that, you know, I'm happy that my wife made me go to, you know, a certain physical therapist who finally gave me the right information and one thing led to another and I'm doing things that or helping my back live its best life now. Are we doing? Are we just doing pop psychology, like vapid, empty pop psychology here? Uh, or is it just that I, simple? I honestly don't care if we are. If we are, who cares? If it, yeah, is, it, care. is it effective? Uh, does it make All it, we need is love. Does it make just a difference? Throw that in there. Be, because, you know, we're, are, we're pretty complex creatures, us humans, and our brains, and we, we, it, we've got, like we've said before many times, and somebody else said it before me, we've got Stone Age hardware, and we're running modern day software on it, and it leads to a lot of different problems. And I think that um, you can live a life where you're constantly stressed out, and you're, there's a bunch of cortisol in your blood <laughs> at, all, at all times, yeah. or you can find some simple coping mechanisms that uh, help you get out of your own head and get out of your own way. Separate yourself from your thoughts and realize that you're not, you are not your thoughts. And um, you know, find some joy in the moment and also look to the future with optimism. And I'm not saying that we have done this or are experts at it by any means. I think just what I'm saying is that uh, we spent a lot of time, we're so focused on accomplishing things and succeeding at things that I think a good portion of the last couple of decades of our lives have just been completely consumed with trying to succeed. We've had no time to stop and think about things like personal health and growth in many ways because we've been so focused on our career and just trying to keep up with things and, and, and trying to be good dads and good husbands and the things and the responsibilities that we feel like the world has put on us. But I feel like the sort of the one addition that has happened to me in the past few years, and therapy has been the most uh, tangible catalyst for this, is just this sense of working on myself. And, and it has made me, I, I, the thing I told Jesse, it was like I feel just a lot more excited about the next chapter of my life. If I'm dividing my life into two halves, and I'm kinda entering into the second half, um, I am approaching it with a lot more excitement and not this sense of regret about what I didn't do but more about what, I, what I'm gonna get to do and, and of course and it could all fall apart and I could face incredible disappointment and tragedy and whatever it might be but I, what I'm trying to do is get to a place where um, the external circumstances and the outcomes don't affect my well-being as much. And I, you know, I think a factor for me in being at this point is the fact that we've experienced the success we have. I feel like in my brain and in my heart, it's given me the space to then explore things that I didn't give myself permission to do. And I'm not, I'm not proud of that. I think that's a lesson learned that, you know, I, I don't like turning this into something prescriptive. I just like sharing our own experience. So I'll keep this on myself and say to my past self, you know, I, in terms of, more self-discovery and you know, allowing myself that time for myself, even though I was r chasing after things. And the reason why the 20s were such a perilous time was because we were scrappily trying to make things happen and it was, I feel like, that there's an art to f living your best life now in the midst of those things. Right, mm. uh, we just happen to be at a point where you know, I mean, everything's not going great. I, I mean, it's not, but um, there's an art to that. Whatever life throws at you, there's still a there's still a, there's still space for um, there to be some bestness, and you deserve to have some bestness, you know. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I think it's, so I'm gonna say not the 20s, the 40s. The 40s. The 40s. The 40s and beyond are the best years 
of our lives. And Those with that, were the best years of our lives. I'm gonna leave you with a wreck. Uh, wreck baby, wreck baby, one, two, three, four, wreck baby, wreck a, baby, one, it's two. A, it's a book that's made a big difference in, in my life. A uh, book. Joel Osteen's <laughs> Live Your Best Life Now. <laughs> what, a, what a coincidence. What is the name? Yeah, I had planned on recommending this. No, uh, I can't say that I would recommend that book. I don't know Joel, uh, haven't read the book. Um, good for you if you read it and you got something out of it. But what I, uh, <laughs> I actually was planning on recommending something else, but I will do, I'm gonna recommend something I've recommended before, but I'm gonna say it again. Therapy. Oh, um, did you just change your answer? Yeah. Oh. I actually had something else, but I can save it because it was completely unrelated and um, I can use it for another time. Uh, I've talked about it before, but I know that I thought that there was a stigma attached to therapy because I thought that you had to have an acute mental issue in order to um, go to therapy, but to me, if you wanna use the analogy of a car, I think that um, the idea of like, I don't take my car in, man, until I got a problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? But I think uh, if you want your car to continue to run clean, you want it to be trouble free, you take it in for the scheduled maintenance, man. And the scheduled maintenance of You can your... watch my daughter on The View, or whatever <laughs> she's on. And the scheduled, <laughs> Uh, the scheduled maintenance of your body, there's an, there's an interesting dichotomy that somehow in our culture we have this huge mind-body split uh, and we're like, yeah, I got a problem with my knee. That's something I can talk to my boys about. I know that I'm characterizing everyone who's ignorant as with a southern accent and I'm just doing it because that's where I'm from. Well, I just are, think that was George Bush and those, specifically. And those are, those are the kinds of accents that I do. Um, but uh, trust me, I'm a redneck at heart so I've got nothing against that. Uh, but the idea that you can talk freely about your physical problems, but when you get to talking about mental problems that suddenly this isn't something you can share with a friend, this is something that you're gonna be judged for, uh, that's an unfortunate side effect of something that's gone wrong with this particular society. And you say mental, you mean, I mean emotional. Mental and emotional. All types of. Uh, and I think that uh, I wish I had discovered it earlier and uh, I highly recommend it and you know, I know that for a lot of people, cost is an issue, and I don't know what the solution is for that. I know at one point we recommended better health, but then you couldn't recommend better health because there was some controversy around the people that, that I don't know even know what the deal was, but they're not a sponsor anymore. But I, I don't know what the uh, the alternatives are for sort of low cost, uh, you know, mental help, mental health help. But I'll just say that um, I think they have clarified their um, their the the qualifications of the people and that cleared some things up and they also refined what t uh, types of uh, issues that they're tackling. Okay, so, so do, I, do your I, own research I do on not, that. I, I do not, I'm not gonna say that it is an illegitimate resource. Okay. I would encourage people to check that out on their own. And Yeah, um, so I, I'm just saying that do your own research to find out where affordable, you can get some affordable therapy but I just I would just say that I believe that it's a priority, and there's probably some things that you know, you're spending money on that may not be as important. And so uh, you know, do what you can to to find that help. All right, it's important. It wasn't a book, it wasn't an album, but that was pretty good. Right? Yeah, pretty good. All right, hashtag Ear Biscuits. Keep talking at us, and uh, we always enjoy hearing your feedback. And also, we enjoy hearing if you introduce other people to these conversations. Hey, you should you should check out Ear Biscuits. These guys are filling the blank with whatever you think will resonate with them. Make it up if Lie you to, to them if you need to. Just fabricate all marketing, the entire thing. All marketing is lying, so like, just lean into it. Yeah, yeah, just, we yeah. just, we, we need it. If you think, oh, you're, if you think, your fr if you think your friend would be more into two women, just say it's two women and they're really funny. Or whatever. It, it'll take a few episodes for them to figure it out, but hopefully they'll be hooked by then. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.